I get questions about the proper care of western hognose snakes almost every day, and by far the vast majority of those questions have to do with feeding. And it doesn't take very long for you to do a Google search and find a bunch of terrible information that might actually lead to the death of your snake. So in our very first episode of the Hog Blog, we're going to be covering feeding. I'm Dan Kroll, and you're watching the Hog Blog. The Hog Blog is brought to you by Rodent Pro. Open 24 hours a day at rodentpro.com. And Vision Products, the best rack at the best price. Check them out at visionproducts.us. Hog Blog. Hello and welcome to the Hog Blog Episode 1. I'm your host, Dan Kroll, and today we're going to be talking about feeding your hognose snake. Now this is going to be the first in a series of videos about the feeding of hognose snakes, and there's a lot of ground to cover, so we've decided to split it all up. So today's video specifically is going to be about the wild diet of the western hognose snake and the natural feeding response and how you can train and use those two things to make your snake a really great feeder in captivity. Now before I get started though, I'd just like to address one piece of terrible information that I see circulated on the internet all the time. Um, if you Google these care sheets, a lot of them will tell you that hognose snakes are, are very picky feeders and that they don't like to eat. Now this is a dangerous piece of information to give someone, especially for a snake that is actually uh, a glutton. You know, hognose snakes naturally will eat as much food as they can possibly eat, and they have a very fast metabolism. So if you're approaching your husbandry from the idea that these snakes don't eat much, you're actually putting them at risk for, for starvation. So. so first thing we want to talk about is what do western hognose snakes actually eat? Now, unlike their cousins, the eastern and southern hognose snakes, who are kind of specialized, they mostly eat toads and frogs, western hognose snakes are generalists, which means that they eat a whole lot of different things. In fact, they'll eat almost anything that's made of protein. Western hognose snakes have been known in the wild to eat frogs, toads, salamanders, lizards, snakes, birds, bird's eggs, turtle eggs, lizard eggs, snake eggs, just about anything. They will eat anything, and they also eat rodents. So what does all this mean? Does that mean that I need to feed my western hognose snake all of those things? No, not necessarily. And in fact, western hogs in captivity can be maintained completely on a rodent diet, on a lab rodent diet. And most people have raised multiple generations on frozen thawed uh, lab rodents without any issues. Now, can you feed some of these other things? Well, yeah, of course, and we'll get to that uh, later on. And in fact, you'll see that I do sometimes feed my hognose snakes, for instance, uh, baby chickens and, and uh, fish. Yes, fish. No, I'm serious. They eat fish. Isn't that weird? Here, I'll tell you an interesting story. You know, in over in Great Britain, they actually use fish fillets a lot of the time to get baby hognose eating. And I thought, you know, if they'll just eat fish fillets, uh, I wonder if they'll just eat fish. And so, of course, I like to fish. And my kids and I just went down to the creek and we caught a bunch of fish and we took them home and we tried to feed them to the hognose and I'll be darned, they eat fish. Now, I, why would an animal <laughs> that, that lives in the Great Plains and probably doesn't see very much water um, eat fish? Well, I think it's probably because fish and frogs smell very similar. Yes, I smell frogs. What? Don't you? <laughs> but if you ever eat frog leg, it's, it's actually very like fish, and, and frogs do have sort of a fishy smell to them. So I'm thinking maybe that that's probably why. But for whatever reason, hognose snakes will eat fish, and they, they will eat things that are scented with fish, like, for instance, um, canned salmon, which we'll talk about later when we get to the scenting uh, portion of our video. So now that we know what our hognose snake eats, let's focus in on how to feed them in captivity, okay? Now my approach to training a hognose snake to eat, and I do mean training, is one of classical conditioning. Now classical conditioning you may be familiar with. Um, there's a guy named Pavlov who had the famous Pavlov's dog. And the basic concept is he would bring in bloody meat, show it to the dog, the dog would drool, and uh, he would ring a bell. Ding, 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 so the dog would hear the bell, see the meat, drool, all that stuff, right? And he would do this over and over again, bell meat, bell meat, bell meat. So eventually the dog would associate the sound of the bell with the fact that he was about to get some meat. And what Pavlov was able to show was if you ring the bell, even if there's no meat around, the dog can't smell it, can't see it, there is no meat, he will still drool and do all the things that he was about to do uh, if, if there were actually meat present. So basically he is associating a non-food item with food and reacting physically to it. Okay, so we're going to do the exact same thing with our hognose snake. And in order to train our hognose snake using classical conditioning, the first thing that we need to do is to understand the feeding response. So let's talk about the feeding response of the western hognose snake. 
So the feeding response of the western hognose snake can be broken down into three parts. One is the visual, uh, two is the tactile or the touch, and three is the olfactory or the smell, okay? So all snakes use their tongues to smell. They use this organ called the Jacobson's organ that's in the top of their, the roof of their mouth, and their sense of smell is generally, I, I've heard it said, like seven times greater than a dog's. Now, in fact, a western hognose snake can smell food that's buried underground as it's crawling along the surface of the soil. So we know that western hogs have amazing senses of smell. And they do react in kind to food. So if something smells like a food that they like to eat, which we know they eat basically anything, the, they, will, um, they will eat it. So that is, that is one part of their feeding response. But they also have a strong visual component to their feeding response. So when they see movement, things that look like something that might eat, they will react to that. Um, they also have a strong tactile response. Okay, to illustrate this point, let's take a look at this video right here. This is a western hognose snake going after a mouse. Now before you start sending in hate mail, yes I am teasing this snake. I normally would just give her the mouse, but I'm, I'm uh, taking the mouse away and deliberately pulling it out of her mouth in order to exaggerate the various parts of her feeding response. So it's for educational purposes um, and, and that alone. Normally I would just give her the mouse. So anyway, let's go back to the beginning here and pause it right there. Now you see I touch the side of her face with the mouse and her mouth is open, she's pulling back and she's about to grab it. Normally that's all the time it would take for the feeding response to happen. Boom, she would grab it. But I'm gonna pull it away uh, and pull it out of her mouth. Now watch what she does. She's gonna dive forward, try and grab the mouse. She hits the side of the tub. Now watch the mouse right there. Now I touch the side of her body and see she's lifting, lifting, lifting. She's pulling the mouse towards her and, and towards her mouth. And now she's gonna make a lunge for it. Wham, right there. She's got her mouth wide open. That's sight. So, so she felt the touch of the mouse, she saw it, and then she struck forward. So she was uh, reacting in both touch and sight at the same time. Now watch right here, watch her eyes as I drag the mouse across her vision. Right there, you see that? That is all sight. There's no sound, there's no uh, smell. That's just, she just sees the mouse and she goes right after it with her mouth open. And she's gonna sit right here in this position to see where it goes next. Now watch, I'm not gonna slow it down, but as the mouse goes down to the bottom right of the screen, she's gonna lunge for it. And even though it changes direction, boom, she almost grabs it, right? Now one more time, I'm gonna touch it right there on the back. And this is gonna be the one that leads to the final capture. Watch what she does. Again, she's gonna lift and lift 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 and then boom turn and that's a classic hog strike right there she's turning sideways she's grabbing the mouse and she's captured it now i slowed all that down and cut it up in order to accentuate what's going on but if you speed this up i mean it doesn't take much time even though i'm teasing the snake for all this to happen but there's a lot going on in your average hognose snake's feeding response pretty cool now if you're a smart puppy you're probably thinking right now where's the bell right because if this is a, a classical conditioning, the, the mouse and the chickens and the fish are obviously the meat, but what is the bell? And the answer is, you're the bell. So when you approach the cage, imagine what it looks like to a snake. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Terrifying, right? And this is probably why we get reactions like this when we open up some of our tubs. So the question is, how do you change that, the mad cobra reaction, to the crazy chase the food snake reaction? And the answer is through classical conditioning. You need to train your snake by finding something that it likes to eat and then present that food as quickly as possible between the time you open the drawer and the time that the snake eats so that the snake associates the drawer opening with being fed. So you open the drawer, you give them the food. You open the drawer, you give them the food, you open the drawer, food, drawer, food, drawer, food, until the snake knows the drawer opens, I'm getting fed. And over time, eventually what's gonna happen is that snake is going to develop an association between you, the drawer opening, and being fed. And there you have it, you have a trained hognose snake. So you wanna get your food ready. In this case, it's a thawed pinky mouse. Get it on the tong. And then when you open the drawer, And eventually, over time, you will have a snake that doesn't care whether or not you're there or not and completely recognizes you as either a food source or definitely not a threat, like this little girl does here. And that's classical conditioning. Now, this doesn't work exactly perfectly for every single snake, and we will be covering uh, problem feeders in future episodes. But ideally, what you eventually want to do is create a situation where when the snake hears that tub rattle and sees that big monster coming, 
That means to her, the food bell is ringing. Hugbug. All right, it is time for our U.S. Ark featured breeder, where we speak with a breeder of western hognose snakes. I'd just like to remind you, though, the United States Association of Reptile Keepers is fighting, as we speak, for our right to keep our reptiles as pets against organizations who would outlaw them and pretty much any other pet animal uh, in the United States. So they need your support. Buy a t-shirt, send them five bucks. There are 11 million people who keep reptiles in the United States. If every single one of them gave them five dollars, it would change the game. So support U.S. Ark usark.org. All right, so our very first featured breeder is Brent Bumgartner from Superconda. Brent, thanks for joining us on the Hog Blog. Well, uh, thank you for having me. And you are our, our very first guest on the Hog Blog, and we're, we're really proud to have you, sir. Really? I didn't know that. This is a big surprise for me. Well, it, it makes a lot of sense because right now the anaconda morph is the most popular, probably the most popular morph in our hobby. Uh, everybody has to have one. It's a must-have uh, morph, so we wanted to speak with you in our very first uh, featured breeder. So what I'd like for you to do today uh, for everybody is just tell the origin story. Where in the world did you come up with this? How did you end up with the anaconda? That would be what we call luck. It was from produced, uh, I produced the animal from animals. One animal was the male from Richard Evans from uh, West Texas Reptiles. Uh, it was a head pink mouse bell male. Um, I purchased it as a yearling. And then um, the, the uh, female that produced the anaconda was um, purchased off the uh, chainsnake.com. And um, it was sold as a wild caught problem feeder. I liked her color. Price was right. Bring them together. She, uh, Produced uh, nine perfect eggs, and out of the uh, clutch of nine, there was uh, the uh, first anaconda, the oddball of the group. Um, every animal in the clutch other than the anaconda appeared to be normal. Um, it was a male, luckily, and um, thrived and did well. So we uh, bred the uh, original anaconda male to an unrelated female from another breeder, and clutch of 11. And then uh, we produced uh, half anacondas, and every one of them was a male. That put me back uh, another year because we still needed a female to see where we were at, whether, you know, what anaconda to anaconda would do. Um, so after, um, I, you know, proved it at that point, at least it's not a line trait, and we know it's a dominant trait at this point. And then we finally hit, hit on a female or two, and then when we bred the females, uh, or shall I say bred the three anacondas together, that's when we came up with the superconda, the uh, completely patternless animal, which was just mind-blowing and, and, and just hard to fathom that, I, that I've fallen into such luck. Oh, no kidding, man. What, what did you say when you first saw the first superconda come out of an egg? I was astounded, and I will tell you this, I called in sick at work for two days because I just couldn't stand it. I mean, I was like, I knew it was huge. Um, I could feel it. I was, I was, I didn't sleep. I was stressed. I didn't know which direction to go in. Um, uh, I had a mentor along the way help me, you know, give me ideas on what to do, what not to do uh, with the animal. And he was the first one to see it. Um, and he gave me the exact directions on what to do. And um, it marketed well. It, it brought hognose snakes to a game-changing level where, I mean, it was competing price-wise with ball pythons. Right, and the rest is history. The, uh, the Superconda and the Anaconda have become must-have for anyone who has a hognose collection, especially those of us who breed. And what's really amazing about it is the variability within the gene and, of course, the infinite combinations that are out there now that people are starting to recombine these with different genes, uh, you know, from albinos to anneries to uh, toffees. Brent, i got to ask you while I got you on the line, what is your favorite uh, combination of the Anaconda with another gene? I'd have to say the anaconda. Yeah, the anaconda super, anary super, what I call the silver streak, um, which is the name I gave it uh, before I was able to produce it. So it was, I wasn't the first to produce it, so I don't know if it was ever labeled. Um, but that was the name I intended for the animal before I produced it. At this point, that would be my all-time favorite patternless hog nesting at this point. Oh, that is an that is an instant classic. It's such a beautiful animal. Uh, 
I love the azampic or anery condom myself. I think that that is a, a beautiful snake. Well, Brent, I must say, I really appreciate you taking the time to stop by and tell us this, uh, this awesome story. If someone wanted to pick up some of your snakes, where would they go? Superconda.com. If there's anything I can help anyone with at any time, feel free to call. Um, you know, my phone's always close by. All right. Thanks, brother. Thank you. All right, and that was Brent Bumgartner from Superconda.com sharing with us the origin story of the Anaconda Morph, this very first featured breeder on the hog blog. Thanks for watching, and please support USARC, the United States Association of Reptile Keepers. Okay, what I need you to do right now is stop everything you're doing and click the subscribe button. I would really appreciate it. And share this with people. If you think that the information you're getting here is good, and if you think this effort is worthwhile, then please spread it around, okay, and help support it, help it grow so we can get more good information about keeping these awesome snakes out there on the internet. If you have any questions or suggestions, please use the uh, comments down below, or you can email me at hognoseblog at gmail.com. I'm Dan Kroll, and thanks for watching the Hog Blog.